Carbon dioxide is a plant food. It's necessary. Uh, Say that again. Carbon dioxide is what? It's plant food. It's plant food. Yeah. During my discussions with a lot of climate change skeptics, I've often heard that CO2 is plant food and that putting more in the atmosphere is a good thing for plants as they will grow faster and produce more. Which is a very good point. As you can see from this video from CO2 Science, plants can indeed grow a lot faster if you give them more CO2. And this is exactly what a lot of growers do in their greenhouses. They add CO2 to stimulate the growth of their crops and increase their yields. So what people are saying with this argument is that it's just another fertilizer, like nitrogen. So you should get the same benefits if you increase a nutrient. But with nitrogen we do see that there is a point where if you add too much nitrogen, plants get more susceptible to pests, as they will grow so fast they cannot develop their defenses properly or fast enough. And there's even a point where too much nitrogen will kill plants. So does this also happen with CO2 or do we just get the benefits from it? Fortunately, scientists are researching this very question. They did research on soybeans, grains, maize to see how the plants respond to increase CO2 in the atmosphere. And most importantly, they did this in test fields outside of greenhouses, where plants are subject to the same environmental stresses as any other crop. For example, for soybeans, they found that if they simulated the atmospheric content of CO2 predicted for 2050, that's 550 parts per million, but the plant's defenses are weakened. The pests were able to eat more of the soybean plant, produce more offspring, and subsequently do more damage to the plant. The abundance of insects is greater there, but not only that, insects consume more of that high CO2 leaf than they do of the corresponding leaves grown under current CO2 concentrations. If you look at the research results of grains, they found that if you subject them to the same CO2 levels, this can reduce the protein contents of grains by up to 20%, as the higher CO2 levels reduce the plant's ability to absorb nitrogen from the soil. So increasing CO2 levels in a greenhouse does act as a fertilizer and gives yield advantages as those plants are protected from pests and elements. But as soon as you expose plants to increase CO2 levels outside a greenhouse, the results we see tell a different story. As current research indicates that positive effects are reduced or offset by environmental factors. And these are just some of the effects of a plant's direct exposure to an increase in CO2. I also haven't included all the other effects an increase in CO2 will have on our ability to produce crops. As climate change will shift hardness zones, change rainfall patterns and expose plants more and more to heat stress. There's a real chance we might lose the ability to produce crops in areas that are very productive at the moment, like the North American Southwest. These effects can have serious consequences for the amount of food we can produce. If we continue to increase atmospheric CO2, this will have as a consequence that we need to continually develop new technologies and crops to deal with it. And the question remains if we can do that fast enough to deal with those changes. With the past decade as the hottest decade on record, we are now starting to see the effects of climate change on our ability to produce food, especially with 2010 already being one of the hottest years on record despite a solar minimum and a La Nina. Suffocating heat and smog are not just a health concern in Moscow. The heat wave could mean higher prices for bread worldwide. Russia, the world's third largest exporter of wheat, estimates severe drought and wildfires have already destroyed more than 20% of its wheat crop. Last Thursday, Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin imposed a ban on grain exports for at least the rest of the year to prevent an increase in domestic food prices. The dry season started much earlier than expected, and millions of people living along the Mekong River are suffering as the water level drops to the lowest in decades. Along the Ing River, a tributary to the Mekong, farmers usually pump water to irrigate their crops. But farmer Suriwan Suwandi says the river, which normally is about two meters deep, is less than half a meter deep. His crop is only a third of what it should be. Also being hard hit is Pakistan's agriculture sector, affecting the economy and the livelihood of many farmers. Many crops have been destroyed in Punjab, the country's agricultural centre. Sources say half a million tonnes each of wheat and sugar have been destroyed by the worst flood in Pakistan's history. Pakistan's agricultural heartland, Punjab province, is amongst the hardest hit. And several villages in northern India were also hit by flooding, damaging crops across the region. Here's more. The rains have stopped, but the flood-like situation in Mohali in India's northern Punjab state has destroyed plenty of cropland. 260,000 acres of crops have been damaged, damaged in seven districts. 
There's also a loss of life. A lot of cattle have been killed in this flood, and lots of houses have been damaged. A lot of wells have been submerged. And these are just the worst cases this year, as we've had crop damages around the world. And with current projections on a business as usual scenario, there's a real risk that, for example, the United States will face another dust bowl. This is a serious issue we face and one for which we can take action that will prevent worse and can reverse the effects. The question is, will we respond fast enough?